General practice is really struggling today. More of us want to go to see our GP more often and we all want to be seen straight away. For general practice to deal with that, it needs more GPs. But unfortunately, those GPs don't exist. Worse, for the GPs who are there, they're either retiring or they're going abroad to Canada, to Australia, to New Zealand. As part of our programme, what we're trying to do is find out what it's like for GPs on a day-to-day -day basis and what they think the solutions are. We want to find out, do they think the government's new deal for general practice, 5,000 more GPs, extra support for premises, whether that's going to make any difference and whether the NHS's own plan, the five-year forward view, is actually going to help the day-to-day -day problems that general practice faces. I've spoken to a whole range of GPs and I started by asking one what his working day was really like. I changed the system fairly significantly uh -huh. where we had no routine book call appointments so we just had telephone triage. So I would do 150 telephone calls a day. 150? 150. Normally sometimes 120 in the morning and then up to 70 in the afternoon with just one GP just to be able to deal with the demand and the access. So our access has been extremely good per 1,000 patient head yeah. compared to the rest of the county because of that telephone system. 150 calls in a day, in what, how long's a call? Three minutes? Five Three minutes. minutes. So that's 450 minutes, we're talking well, seven, that's a whole day gone, isn't it? A whole day telephone calls and then fitting in, seeing them. So we'd end up being the first four hours of the day with telephones and then two hours of seeing them and then start again. So hopefully the afternoons we'll, we'll sort of manage things a bit better. So your average working day, what you're, you're in here working from, from when to when? I tend to get in about half six yeah. uh, and then start doing telephone calls from seven. Yeah. And uh, that's two days a week and then normally start phone, phone calls from eight. And that goes through to when in the... Until half six at night. Right. That's when you officially close, but yeah. it doesn't normally close. That's closing doors for business, then the, the paperwork and the admin starts after that. So what time are you getting home at night? Half nine, ten. Wow. So how, how do the pressures in general practice impact on, on your practice here then in Daventry? I think it's similar to lots of other, most other places where we really struggle with the, the amount of work you have to do on, on the same day. There's just this overwhelming demand which um, doesn't seem to go away. When we're all here, it, 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 it's great, but you know, with 15 people that's probably only two or three weeks each yeah. year. You have to start a bit earlier to try and make sure you're on top of things at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day you're still left, left with those jobs that you might have got done during the day uh, in the past so mm -hmm. so it, it, it's a lot more intense and the, the the speed and the pressure that you need to work at is it, it, greater than I, I've experienced in 20 years. It's almost like we have this perfect storm isn't it? We've got mm -hmm. workload going up, yeah. you've got the workforce to deal with that workload going down and then for the people who remain they're under this intense pressure. Over the last five years, GPs are seeing probably at least uh, an extra 10% of patients. You know, how um, disease hasn't changed, you know, illnesses haven't changed, yet people's expectations uh, uh, of the health service have increased and, in, you know, with the consumer society that we're on. So the thing that's killing it is on the day demand. As a result of the extra workload, GPs have had enough and are literally walking away. And GPs are not just retiring, many are moving abroad. I mean, I think, you know, GPs, as per any professionals, you know, obviously look at, um, you know, where, you know, you know, what's best for me, what's best for my family. Um, so we had a partner who'd left last year um, because she, had, she felt she had better opportunities in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly with the world becoming smaller and, uh, you know, people are looking at Canada and, and Australia for, certainly for GP jobs. Um, yeah. I've got experience of working in Australia my, my, myself. Um, so of course that is an issue, but I think that's no bad thing um, mm. because I think we have to just wake up and smell the coffee as a country um, because in order to ensure that we secure and yeah. keep our own talent, we've got to make sure that we're providing kind of, you know, great places to work, you know, maybe using things like the technology to do some of the heavy lifting for us. Right. Um, so certainly that was another impetus for us, you know, just to try and make sure we were just trying to do things yeah. as best as we could. I've been very proud to have worked in the NHS for over 30 years now, um, but um, I've decided to um, take my pension early. Um, I'm 58 next birthday and I'm going to take my pension 
two years ahead of time. Um, and what's, and what's brought you to that decision? Really, the, the, the workload um, has significantly increased in the last um, decade, um, particularly. Part of the challenge that general practice has is for people exactly like you, that particularly the, this 55 to 60 year old group of really, really exper experienced, talented GPs who are choosing to leave, yeah. somehow the profession has to find a way of saying, we still need you yeah. and the profession needs you and how are we going to find a way for you to stay? I am so much better uh, a GP than I was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, I, I feel I can uh, interact um, much better with people. Uh, I can get to the core of the problem much more quickly. Um, and I think it is a tragedy for the NHS to have um, people of my age leave prematurely. One of my partners, is, you know, he admits that he, you know, he's, he's only 57, he's done his time and actually um, you know, he's decided to retire at the end of this year. So, so you know, we're, we're not only you know, growing the, the population uh, list, but also we're, we, we have a retirement to deal with. And that's, and you know, he's 57, you know, he's yeah. a high caliber, hard working GP who, you know, has done a lot of good work. And we're seeing this across the board in Northamptonshire. There were two partners across the road, uh, and uh, one of those partners left to work in New Zealand and they were unable to recruit a partner. They managed to recruit salaried doctors. Mm -hmm. um, and so that has affected the long-term stability of that practice. Um, and actually we're working together with a view to joining the two practices up and working as one single practice from April next year. As a small practice, I think it's magnified. Um, obviously the workforce issue, uh, we've took us almost a year to recruit another doctor after the sudden retirement of my partners. Um, and we advertised five times nobody applied. We actually ended up having to use headhunters to find these doctors. Really? Which so is this another, is for another partner? For another, no, this is another salary doctor. Just for a salary doctor? Another salary doctor. So you got no applicants or? We had, no, we had one applicant for to do one day a week. Right. Which we couldn't really manage on and we yeah. offered her the job and she found somewhere else. So what did you do when you had, so you've got, vacant, you've got these vacancies, mm -hmm. no, no one to fill them. What, what did you do for that? Period? Locum agencies. Was that expensive? Extremely expensive. We, they were charging between 800 and 1,000 pound a day. So as a young doctor, why would you want to come and work as a GP partner when you could get 1,000 pound a day to do exactly the same job? Mm. Uh, so it was a significant cost pressure to us, which, which had knock-on effect to do the entire development of the surgery. And how long were you running on uh, locums? Uh, 12 months. So 12 months at 1,000 pounds a day? Yeah. That must have had a big hit on the viability of the business? It did. It's, it, it wasn't five days a week that we were doing it because I, I worked on my own for those periods of times and we, used to, we did it with just two, a day, two, two days a week and then I just couldn't deal with doing five days straight for a year. So yeah. we decided to take the hit on that and, and bring them in to, to work more on those days. So eventually you did, you did find doctors through a headhunter? Yes, through head, two headhunter agencies. Uh, very expensive. Very expensive. With twelve and a half percent of their yearly salary, um, which, considering one of them was looking for a job in Northampton anywhere, and we didn't actually headhunt them from another practice, was a little bit of a yeah. annoying annoyance factor, I should say. Um, and the other one we had to pay the locum agency for, so they didn't find her. She'd already working with us as a locum, but we had to release her from the locum agency to work with us full time. So, how's the how's the business then? So, with with all that additional cost going into trying to you know, keep this what's quite a small surgery going, how's that? The business side is, is very, has been impacted significantly. We, we are just viable, our profits went down £15,000 in the last, last tax year, mm -hmm. which, uh, with, which mm -hmm. mostly was a reduction of our NHS income, our non-NHS income, because I was sole here, also reduced slightly because I couldn't go out and get the non-NHS income type work. The knock-on effect has been that we are now maxed out with the support from the bank. Uh, we um, are therefore in this position where if we have any unexpected costs, any damage, any, anything going on, we, we would have to 
business cases for with the bank to get any extension, any support. The days where banks would support GP practices because we were GP practices seem to have gone. Um, in a way it makes sense because we have to be businesses, um, but to having to do a business case to be able to stay viable mm. was, a, was a shock. So how often are you seeing your bank manager at present? Uh, every two weeks. Wow. A phone call probably once a week. Right. It's clear that one of the problems is that there's not enough money in general practice. At a recent answer time, Dr Gavin Ralston explained just how cheap general practice is. In terms of the funding that, that, that general practice gets, it's actually quite low uh, compared to the rest of the, of, of the NHS. I think about 90% of all contacts take place in general practice, yet it, it gets about 7% of the total funding. And actually the share of the funding has been reduced over the last few years. So per patient, it works out a year um, at about 130 quid which per day is about 37p, which is quite good value really uh, for, the, for the access that currently is provided. In fact, that costs a lot more to insure our Labrador than it does to, uh, <laughs> to, to fund, a, fund a person. And in fact, it costs a lot more to insure a hamster. Uh, 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 so so it's, it's still relatively good value and, and, and a pretty good service. The government have promised more money and more doctors as part of its New Deal for general practice. But in return, Jeremy Hunt wants GPs to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. I asked the GPs what they thought of this new deal. I, I think it didn't go nearly as far as it could have done. It didn't paint any ambition other than trying to do the same job it, it, with a bit more intensity. And it, and, and it plays into the seven day services piece that was a blatantly political promise during the campaign, which hasn't been thought through at all, to do different uh, work um, a, a across a seven-day service, which at the moment is, is impossible with the workforce almost on its knees. If you were in charge of policy for general practice, what would you be saying? Undoubtedly, uh, in providing same-day care, in providing high-quality chronic disease management, size matters, and, and it is a, a, a question of scale. So you need to build partnerships which are able to deliver services across seven days. Now, I don't think that we need to be delivering routine GP surgeries on a Sunday afternoon, but I think we, we need to be delivering high quality uh, triage and out of hospital care on a, on a Sunday afternoon, which relies on having experienced people leading that rather than uh, having to deliver it. If the government's new deal for general practice isn't the answer, then what is? The NHS has its own plan for the future, the so-called five-year forward view. Everyone in the NHS agrees it's the right thing to do, but is it going to deal with the day-to-day -day problems that general practice faces? Transformation of general practice is, is, is essential to enable the, the accountable care organisations, the new models of care, to be able to work. And that does include changing our mindsets as, a, as GPs, as businessmen, about how we work together and how we do things. At a conference recently, we talked about um, uh, acute hospitals becoming primary care providers. And during that, I was the only GP in that, in that conference, and it was very interesting to see their opinion of primary care. They actually don't really know what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's where we need to blur that line more, is that the secondary care realise how much we do and how much the work is generated by them for us as well. Well, I think the multi-specialty community provider is, is really interesting, but I don't think it paints a, a picture for day-to-day -day general practice. It paints a picture for delivering hospital services in a different uh, in environment, and I think it's really exciting, and actually within the the locality of Daventry in South North Hants, we've uh, just completed a, a feasibility study for, for having a, a multi-specialty community provider, which looks really exciting, and the practices through a, a well-established provider organisation look, are looking to take that together. But I think it's the lack of consideration of what happens day to day in, in general practice, and actually that it, it almost gets forgotten um, in, in all of the policy making, all of the political debating. Um, and because of that, the, the more exciting new models of care uh, 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 don't particularly apply to it. The aim, pretty much the same as a lot of GP practices around the country, is to join a federation in a super partnership. Um, and we're pretty close to making a final decision, but that'll happen this year. So it's got to a place where as a 
small practice of just over 4,000 patients, yeah. you feel yeah. to carry on on your own isn't yeah. the way forward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I think p p part of the, there are many um, kind of positive um, reasons for moving forward with, with, a, with a super partnership or a bigger practice. Okay. Uh, but one reason I'll, I'll absolutely be, be frank is. Um, because we're all feeling a little bit overburdened with the regulation, it's better for you know groups of us to get together and just get yeah. somebody you know just 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 feeding the beast and keeping you know the, the powers of be satisfied. Mm -hmm. So actually, the rest of us can be innovative and get on with the real job that needs to be done. So what will be different then for your practice being what part be of, a, of, a, of a super partnership? We would hope in time to be providing a kind of wider range of services to patients. People are talking about um, you know a lot of uh, our secondary care colleagues, uh, hospital doctors. There may be a good reason why they're sort of plonked in this great big building in the middle of a town we call a hospital. You know, yeah. why are dermatologists sitting there? They don't necessarily need to be there. You know, much better maybe for them to be out. You know, in a community. So you know, a bigger super partnership could sustain. You know, a dermatology partner maybe, um, right. who and she or he could then rotate between practices or could be on hand to provide some expert input when we'd wanted a specialist. Uh, you know, a bit of in, uh, information. So more convenient services services for patients. I think that way. You can help with workload because at a bigger scale you're more flexible but also you begin to build in the quality around chronic disease management so if we think that um, within a within a practice you've got a lot of people who are who've got heart failure so a smaller population of, of maybe 20 30,000 people can have expertise in heart failure great day-to-day -day work being managed better has an impact on the whole system but actually raises the quality for patients if you then looked at MS or something like that, you, you need a much bigger population to, to manage it across. So, you know, maybe 100,000, 200,000 people, I'm not sure. But if you said to GPs, we are raising the quality at the same time as doing something around your workload and your, your pay and rations, that is the way I think you get into that conversation of um, change. Now, the problem is, in the past, whenever anybody's talked about size in general practice, particularly the BMA, it says you can't touch it. You know, the, the practice and the small practice, any practice is sacrosanct. That unit cannot change. So it, it, it's trying to push that change through with a different paradigm rather than that, you know, every practice has got to be 25,000. Well, actually the form of the practice doesn't matter, but it's what it can do. In some places, this move to operating at scale has already started. Some GPs that I spoke to told me about the steps they'd already taken and why. I think in terms of working together we've got a very collaborative group um, within the Federation uh, and already we're providing services jointly across the practices uh, and you can see that expanding. So at the moment we have a collaborative care team which provides um, case management in the community uh, but you can see the opportunities for simple things like back office things, like notes summarising, secretarial support if your secretary is away, um, and sharing of staff through the organisation. Could you see then a point where all the practices within the Federation decide to become a single organisation? I think that's uh, well, it's a political question, isn't it, in terms of the direction we get from the government concerning that. Yeah. But we're certainly we are in a position to move in that direction, um, should that be what's... And then with the five-year plan, that looks like it's the direction that, that we're in a position to move with that. Well, well let's talk about the five-year forward view, because it, in that, it talks about these new models of care, particularly accountable care-style organisations, where an organisation, whether it's primary uh, and acute care services or the multi-specialty community provider, actually have the responsibility for a population. So rather than getting paid on a fee-for-service basis, they get you know, the money for the whole population. So uh, conversations that say, we need to become a business, we need to be a big hitter in this so that it runs in a way that's built around the registered list and around general practice rather than around the established, the establishment of healthcare organisations. Yes. Um, we've we've, we've looked, looked, kept our options open from that point of view. So we've had discussions uh, with the uh, local community trust and with the local hospitals about working collaboratively to develop that model mm -hmm. rather than doing it in a competitive way. As someone in, in a GP practice, so we, what do you think? I mean, do you think it, we can do it staying as it is? Do you think federations is enough or do you think it needs to go all the way into sing, big single organisations? 
the straightforward answer is I think it needs to be a single organization if I'm pressed, that's my personal view, yeah. is that I, I, it, it's hard to see how the other models will right. work and, and be effective. But there's resistance to that, isn't there? But yeah, so then you, then you get into the complexity of, of clinicians, you know, trying to get clinicians all working yeah. together in the same way. You know, when there's, when there's different levels of income, there's different levels of workload, yeah. and there's different practices. So how do you standardize that delivery of care when you have those three underpinning right. variables? When you're, you know, and everybody can say, yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that, but you're seeing half the patients that I'm seeing. So yeah. of course you're going to deliver a better quality of service, but I, you know, I haven't got five partners that, you know, I'm just, you know, and I can't recruit and I'm working from a building that's not fit for yeah. purpose. If I'm the GP who's going to see my bank manager every eight weeks to extend my overdraft so I can pay my staff, yeah. am I not looking for something more from the CCG than a, a sort of vision of five years time that feels like a never, never, when what I'm after is more support for, for what's happening today? Um, yeah, so, so there's the here and now issues that are facing a lot of GPs and, and then that future direction. So, so I guess if I was that GP going to see the bank manager, what the bank manager will want to know is w what's my five-year strategy. So rather than keep on extending and extending your overdraft without actually a clear strategy, if we can paint that five-year vision to say, actually, the reason that you need to you know, continue supporting and investing in my practice is because the gains are going to be great and we will be able to uh, turn around the finances of individual practices, you know, uh, um, allow Northamptonshire to be a great place to work and attract more GPs into the system. You know, that's where we need to get to. So, so what we absolutely can have is practices folding. I mean, then it's a house of cards. So, so th there are immediate issues around some, some practices. But I think if, if we can create that, then the bank manager will say, actually, instead of going, you know, eight weeks to eight weeks thinking, I'm, I'm skeptical, but, you know, I, I trust you because you're a GP, but I'm not sure. Actually, if we can say, actually, year one, this is how it's going to look. Year two, this is where we're going to be. But by year five, you know, it's almost a dragon's den yeah. scenario. That's, that's the level of uh, ambition we need to get to. Is it time, do you think, for some of the GP leaders who've got now you know, well, two years experience of being a, a statutory body, you know, in Northamptonshire, yeah. you know, eight years experience of working as part of the system. For some of those GP leaders to actually move from the CCG into sort of general practice, as in transforming general practice to get to where it needs to be to play its part in delivering that vision. You're right. To answer your question is that we do need to start shifting GPs and management resource into these federations to really accelerate their development quickly. Given the challenge that the federation faces in terms of being able to develop quite rapidly, it would seem in quite a short time scale, what support do you think you know, your federation needs going forward? It needs the knowledge of the, CC, the CCG is behind them in terms of this, this is the right way to go in yeah. terms of development. Uh, and, it, and once you've got that, the, the, the enthusiasm which we've got within the local GPs to progress the model will be um, maintained. Mm -hmm. uh, it needs a small amount of financial support in terms of managers who've got uh, experience of developing new services. While the journey ahead is a tough one, it's one that general practice is going to have to make. It has to start now. Because of the problems that general practice faces, it needs to do this if it wants to survive. I realise as a small practice, we can stay as a small practice as an independent business. However, we can't ha do the same competition as the big practices do. So the only way we can compete in the current market is to be part of a, a looser federation rather than a formal merger. So what's your personal expectation then? So you've invested what I assume is thousands of pounds into this federation. What, what do you expect to get back? I expect to get it as a, as a way of surviving. 
in, the, in our current situation. I see it as a way of, of, of economies of scale, sharing the, the management experience across in bidding for, for as, as the, the ways of contracting changes, bidding for enhanced services, being, a, being able to provide services, extra services that we can hear, but in the right sort of financial security and remuneration for it as well. Thank you.